Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, November the 21st. I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Today uh, is November 21st. It's almost the 55th anniversary of the assassination of uh, American President John F. Kennedy. Uh, maybe the only or last truly independent president, independent from, from the corporate structure that runs the world. And he tried to do some good stuff, we think, and so they got rid of him. Um, my guest is para-pundit the, the People's Para-pundit. The People's Para-pundit, Andrew Hunter. So, Andrew, um, we're going to start with the connections to 9-11, or well, wherever, you want, wherever else you want to start. Well, as, as a reference point for, for viewers in today's time, the World Trade Center 9-11 uh, was a virtual copy of the World Trade Center organization that was built up and created to take out JFK. So that's why whenever you hear, see or hear the name World Trade Center, uh, red flags should go up. Yeah, red Why, we were just talking about this a minute ago, why was it necessary for the people who run the United States or the deep state as they're sometimes called, why did they want to get rid of John Kennedy? Well, there's many reasons, and, and it's, not, it's a very complex issue, but basically three, I would say, foreign policy and domestic policy. Um, foreign policy, he was um, going to take the troops out of Vietnam. He, was going, he had a neutral Middle Eastern policy, and he was very pro-Arab nationalism, to name about three reasons why they didn't like that. And domestically, uh, he wanted to take the creation of the money system back to the people. So he had given an executive order to, to the, for the, the government of the U.S. to start creating its own money. So there are many red flags there, alarming people in those, all those areas, intelligence, finance, uh, the Defense Department, and they all came to the same conclusion, this guy's got to go. Um, after JFK fired the head of the CIA, uh, McClone, in early 1961, um, that obviously was not going to be liked too well by the CIA. So that was one contribution to that. And of course, he didn't send in the air support in the Bay of Pigs you know, invasion, which was another mistake he made. We can talk a bit about the CIA. The head of the CIA, who, I can't remember his name. Well, in, in, in Kennedy's time, yeah. he was John McClone. M, small c, big C, L, O, N, E. Okay. I thought it was, isn't it, wasn't it somebody else uh, who was... Um, who later sat on the commission. Well, the Dulles, the, the Dulles brothers, yeah. that's right. So yeah. the Dulles brothers were heavily involved, and of course they were the previous administration. So the, Alan, the, the Dulles brothers, Alan, and uh, the, the other brother whose name I forgot. Uh, John. Um, they, they, they were heavily involved, obviously as ex-CIA director, which one of them was, and the other one was the Secretary of State. So they were heavily involved as well. Now, Kennedy fired the head of the CIA, Correct, in and early And the CIA, 61. I mean, this was, you know, this is only uh, 45, you know, 18 to 20 years after world, the end of World War II. I mean, the CIA was, had been, had brought the Nazis who escaped the war and helped them to come into the United States and into other, other countries. I mean, the CIA was working with, am, am I wrong here? No, working you're right, with Jack. the Nazis to help them escape justice. Well, let's set the table here. And nothing's for, changed. For the military industrial intelligence complex. Post World War II, we had the military, we had special operations people, we had intelligence people, we had agents provocateurs, we had merchants of, uh, of death who had nowhere to go after the World War II. So, what happened was that whole complex merged into a business commercial front, which would allow them to continue so-called out in the open on a business sense, but underground, right, right, they would right. be up to many dirty deeds. Right. And as a result, they okay. set up this corporation, this web of okay. Put deceit, yeah. which started with World Trade Center in Rome in 1959. It was called in Italian Centro Mundiale Commerciale. Which means? World Trade Center. So if I can just refer to JFK, for those who know their JFK uh, information. 
there was one scene in JFK where Ke um, Kevin the Costner, the movie, movie JFK, Kevin Costner as Jim Garrison, the New Orleans prosecutor who's trying to get to the bottom of the JFK hit, is questioning Clay Shaw, Tom Tommy Lee Jones, about Commer Central Mundiale Commerciale. Okay. And that was the part in JFK that really struck the truth, you know, in its, in its original, you know, uh, origin. So Central Mundiale Commerciale was set up by the intelligence military post-World War II complex, and it was set up in Rome in 1959. And it was a industrial exposition company which would set up trade offices and companies around the world, and one was, co was called the World Commerce Corporation. So the intelligence industry set up the World Commerce Corporation, and that was used as a front for CIA and other intelligence dark operations around the world. Now, my recollection is that in Europe at this time, probably from the end of World War II until probably the 1980s, and maybe still today, and in fact, Quite, quite probably still today, they were using these business front groups, I'm talking about the CIA and whoever runs the CIA, the deep state, the people who run the United States, they were using these groups to, to commit terrorist acts across Europe and then, and then blame those terrorist acts using their media on whoever the enemy was that they wanted to create, which they still do today, I think. That's right, Jack. Well, what happened was there was called, it was called Operation Gladio, G-L-A-D-I-O, and that was a underground, that was an um, intelligence uh, operation to, to create havoc in the post-World War II countries who were struggling for democracy. There was, a, there was a political vacuum which was allowing the communists to take over in all those countries, and this was to ensure that the communists wouldn't get into power. And when you say the communists take over, you mean they were winning the elections. That's correct, yeah. yes. It was and all, they were going to be that. elected. Yeah. And this had to be stopped. Yeah. Yes. So you had right-wing fascist leaders from Hungary and from Romania and from other countries join this web of deception because they, their, their whole political futures were being threatened by the communist surge in Italy and other countries around Eastern Europe. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll just go back again over the things you mentioned about what John Kennedy wanted to do. And I mean, I, I still remember where I was, uh, you know, 55 years ago at the moment when he, when I heard that he had been killed because it was a different world, you know. It's only gotten crazier since then. And I think, you know, it was like the last gasp for some democracy and it was snuffed out and there is this deep state that runs, not only the United States, they run Canada as well. I mean, all our media, our governments, you know, it's all part of this to make sure there is no democracy. But John Kennedy wanted to uh, get rid of the Fed. He, he wanted, wanted to get rid of the wanted, Federal Reserve, which yeah. is a private financial cartel. It has nothing to do with the government. And what JFK wanted to do, like Lincoln, was get the government back in the business of creating their own money. Right, so you don't have to borrow you know, the it, government the government creates, doesn't go into debt. It's not a debt. private financial cartel, yes. like the Federal Reserve. The government does not have to be in debt if it owns the bank, which in fact it does, but instead we give it over to the private banks and we then borrow money from them. I think the federal, I mean here we're $600 billion is the national debt. Well, you know, we're paying, who's getting? Uh, n neutral Middle East policy. Well, that's true. Um, uh, there was a, I can't remember all the American doctrines, but I believe it was the Truman Doctrine. I could be uh, incorrect in that. The Truman Doctrine was originally supposed to be a neutral Middle East stance by the U.S. And JFK was going to return to that, which meant he would s support both sides equally, but he also supported Algerian independence, which is Arab nationalism. And that was just not done in the early 60s. He fired the director of the CIA. Uh, he refused. The CIA basically attacked Cuba. That's great. Well, we had the we had the Bay of we had the Bay of Pigs. Yeah. The uh, in April of '61. You got to remember that was something that he never signed off on because he only came into office in January of '61. That was an Eisenhower creation. So he, you know, it was his, he, had, he couldn't change it, he couldn't stop it, it was going to go ahead whether he liked it or not. But he just refused to give the air support, and that was one of the reasons why they took him out. 
And I remember, you know, no questions were ever asked at, at the time, you know, just as, as a youngster. Um, no questions were ever asked. Well, first of all, for, for anyone who's into critical analysis and deductive reasoning, and you looked at the whole Lee Harvey Oswald's, you know, lone wolf gunman and, that, you know, end of story, I mean, yeah. it just defies logic and defies any kind of critical no. analysis. So you must dig, dig and drill deeper, which I have for over 30 years, to find out the real source of, uh, and the real people who killed uh, JFK. And the, and, and the most uh, dis disturbing thing to me was the Canadian part in this, whole, in this. Namely, the uber spy of all spies, a Canadian who no one knows, Sir William Stevenson, also known as Intrepid. And the other second in command, the real quarterback, was Major Lewis Bloomfield, another Canadian. So this, the, most, uh, the most astonishing thing here is that the Canadians were the major players in this whole elimination of JFK which a lot of people aren't aware of. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, almost as if an operation like this you might want to run outside of the country that, uh, that is going to be carried out. And, then, and of course, and when you're in the spy craft, uh, the best way to keep, keep um, unknown is to never let the people find out what you, who you are and what you did. And both players I mentioned, Intrepid and Major Bloomfield, have done a great job in masking their identity to the world because no one's ever heard of them. Well, I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say they did such a great job. I would say the people who run them, who also own all the media, did a great job because they never talk about any of this. How, you know, the President of the United States who wanted to pull out of the war in Vietnam, who wanted to create, bring the government in, into, into owning its own currency, who dared to fire the head of the CIA, who had a neutral Middle East policy, this guy is killed. And we were told it was the lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald. We were told that from minute one, and it's never varied. And his picture turned up in newspapers in New Zealand the day after. So you've got to ask yourself, the how, day would, before. <laughs> how, would you, how would you get a picture of Lee yeah. Harvey Oswald in town yeah. in New Zealand on November 23rd unless it was prepackaged, you yeah. know, yeah. To, the, to the editorial? But the, but the thing is, uh, for other Canadian connections here, Montreal played a major part in this whole operation. Uh, Major Bloomfield was located, was, was situated in Montreal. Now, this has nothing to do with the city of Montreal. This is just where, the, where, where things were But the fact is that Montreal put. did play a major part, and Lee Harvey Oswald was in Montreal in June of 1963 in a ban the bomb protest. So one would, would like to know, if he was in Mexico, which we all seem to believe, what was he doing in Montreal in June of 63? Or wherever else they, they cared to put him. If you, if you ever get a chance to watch the movie JFK, it's a great movie. I don't know where anybody would even find it anymore, somewhere online, I guess. But my favorite part of it was where the guy who, the, who was the head of the military protection for the president when he traveled. I can't remember. It was played by Donald Sutherland, but I don't remember the name of the guy. So this was the guy who... Fletcher Prodi, I think his name Yeah, he be. was the guy who was in charge of military protection for... And he said, if, if, if we were there, all windows would be watched, nothing, you know, there was no... no. But he was sent to the South Pole uh, two or three days prior to, to the assassination. Somebody else took over the military protection of the president and it kind of disappeared. Well, it was a coup d'etat, and I think it's up to our viewers and up to the public at large to f realize, do your own research, find your own truth. There is, there is JFK truth out there, you just have to find it. <sighs> Andrew Hunter, thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens One. Hello, welcome back. It's Wednesday, November the 21st. Um, my guest in this segment is Robin Jones, and we're going to be talking about a book he wrote called Letter from Santa Claus, and it's about him. And it's basically the story of a, a young child who gets sick and goes into the hospital and is in the hospital and gets a letter from Santa Claus. That's a beautiful letter and gets better. And that's your story. That's true. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. I just read it. It's a, it's a very, very nice story. And I think what I got out of it more than anything else was how innocent children are, you know, because they do believe it. They do. I still, I still believe in Santa. Yeah. 
fact that I'm 75 and healthy shows. <laughs> What you're else? Absolutely right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> we all should believe in Santa. We yeah, should. And the whole thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm going to start as of now. You know, whatever, whatever that means. Yeah. So, um, you were sick and went to the hospital, and that. I was. Yeah, I, I was actually um, looking around in my attic about four or five years ago. I found an old scrapbook. And in it, I found this letter that I had received from Santa Claus 70 years ago. I still have the letter. And I belong to the uh, Victoria Storytellers Guild. And I told it there a few times. And a friend of mine who's an author here in Canada, he said, well, why don't you get it published? So I went ahead and um, got it published. It took about a year. It's actually about a year this month that I've had the uh, book. So I've been promoting it over n around North America. I've been down to Tucson and down to Los Angeles to the book fairs there. And I drove to Toronto last month to the book fair in Toronto. So the artwork uh, in the book is, I found it very, very attractive. And I did too. And I, I got a price from uh, an artist here in Victoria. There's 24 pictures. And it was above my budget. So I went online. There's a special app you can get. And I said how much I'd like to spend, which was about a fifth of what I got quoted here in Victoria. And I got 741 replies the same day. So I reduced wow. that down to, to four people. And I wanted them all to have um, illustrated children's books. And I chose Marfando. She actually lives down in uh, South America, in Ecuador. And um, she was just fantastic. I said, I, so I sent her my script and I highlighted the words that I'd like to, uh, per page of what I'd like her to do a picture of. She sent me back um, black outlines the next day and then the day after that she colored them in. And if I didn't like it, I said so and next day we'll come back, edit it. It was fantastic. Now who is this picture of? That's a picture of my dad. Okay, so I'll just show this on the screen. If, I don't know if you can zero in on it at all, but uh, yeah. Yeah, my this, yeah. this picture is, is of Robin's dad and as the story goes on. Yeah. yeah. So, and you can see how, how nice the, the artwork is. It's beautiful. Yeah, that was actually kind of funny. My, uh, I'm from a biracial family. Actually, my grandfather was the first black teacher in Toronto in 1923. And I'll just, I'll just be a minute here. My great, great, great grandfather was a slave and was brought up through the Underground Railroad and to, to, to from Ontario, the States from, to escape from Gambia. And then my grandmother's American Indian, I mean Canadian Indian, First Nations, and uh, my mom's Irish. <laughs> so, Sounds like a great family. <laughs> so when people say I'm mixed up, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it was... Um, well, I'll, I don't know what my heritage is that much, but <laughs> I'm just as mixed up, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah so the, uh, yeah, the illustrations, I suggested to her to read the original Rudolph, because it was only been out about 10 years when I, um, when I was in the hospital. And I said, that's the feeling I want, and she totally captured it in this, in, in the illustrations. Yeah, they... I get lots of compliments on the book, on, on the illustrations. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny that your great, great, great yeah. grandfather yeah. came, because, you know, we've gotten so many great people from the United States, oh, and yeah. we're still getting them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's uh, wonderful. We're, we're lucky. And we get great people from everywhere else in the world as well. Oh. It's, uh, it's amazing. Um, I don't know. Um, letters from your sister oh yeah I have I still have the letters that my my sister my oldest sister and my brother and my mom and dad sent me when I was in the hospital I, I still have them they're here and uh, how long were you in the hospital uh, about a month I think yeah something like I can't remember Why really didn't they just text you <laughs> <laughs> well at that time in the hospital you're only allowed one person at a time to come to the room you couldn't, husband and wife couldn't, kids couldn't. So my brothers and sisters had to write me letters. 
and uh, we and have to write him another letter. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I told my siblings that I have the letters, they they're pretty thrilled. So I'm going to copy those and send them a copy of that. Yeah. But my dad came every day to read me um, stories, and especially Rudolph. And um, he used to read us stories around the table at home. I'm one of five kids, so he loved stories, and he. Um, he was used to doing it, and he loved me and wanted to be sure that I was looked after in hospital. Yeah. So it was a very loving thing for him to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, lots of dads, uh, past, present, and future, I mean, that's what they do, you know? It is. Yeah. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So it, uh, good. Uh, promoting the book, Tucson, L.A., Wow, LA, Toronto. Toronto. They're on the move. Yeah, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing different things now. I'm going to try and see if I can get the book reproduced a little less, and then for a little less money, and then be able to uh, put it in some uh, put it in some of the local bookstores too. What's the price? It's seventeen dollars uh, American, so it's pretty steep. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's price. Worth it, but price is always. You know, yeah, price, it's, price it's, uh, it it's, it's always tricky, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what do you do? So you went to, for example, Tucson, which I've heard is a beautiful city. It is. Tucson is really beautiful. And then when we were down there, uh, we went up to, um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Grand Canyon. So I'd been there before, and I took my friend with me, so that was fantastic. So you go to this big book fair, there's about 100,000 people come. And there's authors from all over North America and around the world, and you sign books there, and you're not selling them, you're signing them and giving them away. So uh, lots of lineups for people when you're getting a free book. You're, you're not selling them, you're signing them. You're signing them. them. It's a promotion thing, yeah. Okay, and who are the people? Are they trade, people in the trade? No, just, just uh, people that come in. Um, I was going to say pedestrian. There's about a hundred thousand people. It's a. It's a, It was on a. It was on a university grounds there. It was packed. Yeah. yeah. yeah and there's all these uh, publishers and private um, books and. And it's a way to promote the book. It's a way to promote the book. Okay. And you hope that you meet somebody and whatever. Yeah. You know. So. And the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. I was in a bookstore just the other day, the new chapters, although it's not called chapters, in no. Mayfair Mall. Right. And I think it was the big, busiest store in the mall. Yeah. And I thought, weren't bookstores supposed to be dead like 20 <laughs> years ago? They're, they're back or they never left. Thank, thank goodness for that. Yeah. Apparently, well, I'm going to be doing a reading there, I think, next week or the week after. But there's 23 million current authors right now vying for our money. Wow. That's the ones that are trying to sell their books. So if you self-publish and don't promote, yeah. chances of it being a success are very, very yeah. slim unless something magical happens. So. You could turn it into a play. Yeah, well, it is going to be optioned for, um, for a movie. You pay for all that, but it, it is going to be optioned for a movie, and then they'll see if it if they want to use it or whatever. Right, right, you pay, right, 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 right. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but yeah. if it happens, it's, it's good, you know, and the more, uh, the more it's seen, the better your chances of having it picked up and maybe translated and that sort of thing, yeah. Being in the book selling business is not easy unless you're one of the superstars that's, yeah. that's out there. That's right, yeah. yeah. It's huge business, though. It's a huge business. Well, when you see, uh, when Toronto, Again, there was about 100,000 people there that came down there, and it was all these booths are set up, and thousands of people looking around, buying and selling, and uh, it's a very vibrant yeah. business. I try and read one or two books a week myself. So, What kind of stuff do you like to read? Mysteries and, yeah, mysteries. Yeah, that's what I'm into. So. <laughs> Future plans. Yeah. Ah, future plans. Yeah, I've written another book, but I haven't done anything with it yet. It's just, it's a, it's a child's book as well, but I haven't um, done anything with it yet until I can see some residuals coming in on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also write poetry as well. So I try and write a poem every day if I can. Want to read one? I've got one here. Here's one I wrote 
couple of days ago, it's called It's Almost Christmas. With Christmas almost in our pocket, this, the month goes by just like a rocket. And when December shows its face, we know that we have lost the race. We race to buy the stuff we need, sometimes for pleasure, sometimes for greed, sometimes for reasons that have no reason and just because it is the season. I love the feel that is in the air. We all seem that we want to share, to show how much we love each other, not just our kids and sister and brother. When each and every living thing seems like a bright engagement ring, we know full well the time of year is one that brings us all good cheer. I wish this feeling was innate from birth until the pearly gate. The world would be a better place with love and warmth and caring grace. If that turned out to be the case, we wouldn't have this frantic pace of toing, of to toing here and froing there and showing that we really care. I enjoy the season as it is with love and food and lots of fizz. It balances my inner core like waves that wash upon the shore. And I call myself the poet on princess because I live on princess. Beautiful. <laughs> and, um, and Robin, I think your business, I think you're retired now, but your yeah. business was as a renovator, right? Yeah, I'm a designer, so, renovator, yeah. builder. Yeah, I, I do mean, about 10 or 15 trades. And yeah, so, it's amazing. So I did that amazing. for 40 years, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. I still love doing it. Yeah. yeah. I don't lift as much drywall now, though. Thank God for that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ron. We're okay. out of time. Thank you. Thank you all for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It's segment three. Uh, it's Wednesday, November the 21st. Um, I'd like to thank again our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every two weeks. And my guest is our director, Will Smith. Uh, welcome back, Will. And we're going to talk about a few things, starting off with its revision of Belief Day. It's revision of, thanks Jack, I'm always glad to be here and come on the show. It's a revision of Belief Day for turkeys in the United States because tomorrow is Thanksgiving. And this is a term that uh, one of my, uh, when I was trading, I used to watch uh, Nassim Taleb and he wrote a book uh, about the black swan, about events in the markets that take you by surprise. So his, uh, his idea about revision of belief is that turkeys go along, turkeys live about 100 days, I guess, <clears throat> before they're killed for, I may be wrong in that, but some, they live for some finite amount of time. And all the while they're growing up, they believe that this company or farm is right. taking care of them and, uh, you know, that that everything's wonderful and well, it probably isn't wonderful for turkeys. It may not be for factory turkeys, held, but yeah. but uh, anyway, at the, least they have a hope for the future. At least they have a hope for the future, and and they do get uh, meals. So at some point, though, they get slaughtered, and that on that day, they have to revise their beliefs about the system they're living in. And I think that that's a lesson that all of us could uh, listen to nowadays, because things seem to go along just fine until they don't. And, and that's the kind of thing we have to be aware of what the real situation behind the situation is. So right now we're seeing, uh, the reason we bring that, or that was brought up in the, on Zero Hedge is a, one that I <coughs> watch, one of the sites that I watch. And uh, they were talking about uh, what's happening in the market and in the stock markets. Of course, there's a lot of, of volatility right now and there are a lot of odd things happening. And I like to watch those and just to see what, what's going on to try to give me some kind of a bellwether for what to expect. And, of course, nobody really likes volatility. And Apple stock is uh, going through some volatility right now. And everybody owns Apple stock. It's one of those stocks that you have to own. So, so when you say volatility, and this is November 21st, so what does volatility mean? Well, it means the stock's going up and down yeah. violently. So it went, it went from... Uh, over, I think it was over 200 down to about 180. So that's a 10% drop, a rather precipitous drop. And nobody likes to see that in their portfolio. But evidently, iPhone sales aren't doing well. Now, I don't take it, I mean, I don't care about the micro world of, of that. I just like to look at the, at the big picture. And, you know, there are a lot of things going on right now that might give you some funny feelings, like the, the uh, England, the Bank of England is refusing to ship Venezuela back their gold, which they want back, and they're saying that there's some kind of a problem with not being able to get 
insurance for it, which is kind of ridiculous if you think about it, because of course they could just send a military escort. So Venezuela vessel. has gold. Yeah, most the, countries have their their gold deposited either in London or in in New York, I think. Okay. Uh, so and they want it back. They want it back, and they're not getting it back right now. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things that you have to watch because they kind of slip under the radar of the news because people are interested in, in other things. But what well, is that? I, I'd just say I'll throw something in there. It, it slips under the radar of the news because they don't want us to know these things, <laughs> well, I that think. That could be, too. Yeah, but, but anyway, I mean, that, that uh, could be a relatively important thing. And, I mean, I, I don't think that Venezuela is necessarily going to go to war over that. I mean, what are they going to do? Attack England, the UK? No. But, but what it could mean is somebody is waiting that, in the wings. Well, the, the, in, the United States has indicated its displeasure with Nicaragua and Venezuela and maybe Cuba. So you just kind of have to watch these situations. And then there are other things going on, like uh, just dumping of treasuries, of US treasuries by governments. So we can watch the US dollar. So these are all things that I, I want to watch, and, and I don't want to worry about them, but I do want to keep, sort of keep tabs on them. I read a, a few times, about a month and a half ago, that we have ended a period of quantitative easing, and right. we've entered a period of quantitative tightening. And what that means is that since about 2007, I believe, the world's central banks have thrown in somewhere between 10 and 15 trillion dollars of money. And that's only in like 10 or 11 years. They've thrown 10 or 15 trillion dollars of money into the world's economy in a variety of ways. And most of it has gone to the people at the top. So there's been this inf huge infusion of money at the top and they've used it to you know, buy up the stock market and push those prices up and, and plus housing mm -hmm. and many other things as well. But now we've, they've ended that. They're now, they've stopped putting money in and they're actually beginning to take money out. So there's going to be less money out there. And that was supposed to start happening uh, in the fourth quarter of this year, so October. And right. now we're seeing the stock market dropping a fairly, uh, worldwide, the stock right. market has been down. So... I mean, is, if, if that's what they want to do, if they're going to start pulling money out, then is there any other direction things can go but down? Well, sure. I mean, they can. <laughs> nobody, as a trader, I can tell you that nobody knows what's going to happen. But there's some indication of that. I read a, a little paper by, or a, a letter, I think, by the uh, governor of the Bank of Canada, and he indicated that you know they're going to uh, they're tightening because they because of their inflation targets, they're going to need to tighten. So, so, you know, I mean, mortgage rates in the longer term will be going up. They're at a pretty low, if you look at the graph, it's sort of headed down, and then now it might be construed to be headed back up. I don't see how much lower it can go, because yeah. Yeah. they're historically low. And when we talk about this, I should say that you actually have some expertise in this field, because you work Well, I, I have hands-on uh, expertise. I'm a, I'm a trader. I don't have any, I, I have no uh, degree or anything. You just know from handling money, from trading money. And I have a feel for it, and I've been burned enough times by thinking, this can't possibly do anything but this, and then it does. So I, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but I would expect that, that you're right, that interest rates, the tightening will cause, will be done by tightening, uh, by uh, raising the rates. I have a feeling that at the highest levels, the big picture people, they know exactly what's going to be happening and they're waiting, you know, no matter which way it goes, if you're ahead of the game and you know what's going to happen, uh, you can't lose. So we were also going to talk a little bit about the cannabis situation in the world right. today. Yeah, and I, I've just, uh, I've been participating in some uh, Facebook discussions with people here and, and it's kind of interesting because I'd say that the general consensus is, just to summarize it, is that now that cannabis is legal in Canada, it's illegal. And uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of silly, but uh, things have a ways to go. But meanwhile, in, in other places, in, in Mexico, I, there was a Supreme Court decision at the end of October that, uh, that they're going to have to deal with and make some, they're going to have to have a law a project to, a legislative project to make it legal. And so what did the New Mexican Supreme Court I, I didn't read said. about it very closely. All I, I read uh, in El Tiempo, which is, uh, I think it's a national newspaper, uh, that it would be um, legal very shortly. 
but they have to they have to make it legal. There ha there, that is not the only country where that's happened. I th think it's also happened in the Middle East a little bit, um, and I would expect some more of that to happen. And the other the other interesting thing is uh, the uh, in the United States with the elections and uh, the uh, Jeff Sessions is that right the man uh, who left uh, and he was very anti cannabis. He was uh, oh that oh interesting. And so uh, some of the in investment newsletters that I still sort of gloss over indicate that that this could be a big deal because he was so anti cannabis. But there's so much money behind making it legal now. I mean, there's an article, practically, uh, there's at least an article every week in Forbes now about the cannabis industry. And it's, if, if it's in Forbes, I mean, you know, it's mainstream. That's a mainstream financial magazine. So I would expect that we could see some big moves in the United States. And it would be, it would be sort of ironic if Canada was the, were the leader in getting this, you know, in a, in a G7 country legalized, of being the first one, and then just sort of be eclipsed immediately by a lot of other countries. I mean, with the United States and Mexico now, you know, <laughs> looking like they could be legalizing it much more. It'll just be very interesting to see what happens here. When you started to talk about cannabis, you said now that it's legal, it's illegal. I've sort of heard that said by other people too. What do you mean? Well, <clears throat> typically in the, in the past here, it was provided by people who had expertise, who had developed an expertise for growing cannabis over the past generation or two, I think, you know, in the, in the black market. And now they, a lot of them have just been effectively pushed, taken, out. pushed out of that. And uh, I mean, you know, they're people- it's been corporatized. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, there's one, there was one uh, comment I saw in a Facebook discussion. This woman was saying, why is it that now in the United States, in certain states, uh, it's legal for rich white men to engage in this industry, and I still have a son who's in jail for selling a joint. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a pretty good summary that, you know, things are, things are in flux right now, and you've got some people who are at the bleeding edge and trying to do all these things uh, to make it, to make the industry better and uh, to, <laughs> to make it fair. <laughs> and then you've got, you've got other people who can't see that and who see it just as a nuisance or as something even worse as something destructive. But we still, we still have anecdotal evidence all over. I just read yesterday about a, a child who is autistic and who after just a few days was able to talk after a few days of treatment with CBD. So, you know, this is anecdotal. It's unscientific. But at some point, you have to say, gee, this must have some truth to it that, yeah. that we need this stuff. I think I read somewhere that uh, hemp, which is the material that uh, comes out of the plant, or it's, well, it's the plant. name of the plant. It's hemp. another name. Yeah, it was used in the building of the Great Wall of China. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's... So, I mean, it's been around forever. Um, in the 1930s, I think it was the number one cash crop in the United States uh, because it was used for everything. It, it's used for clothes. It's used, this shirt is hemp. It makes a very good quality paper. It's food. It's medicine. It's rope. It's plastics. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an incredible, incredible plant. Um, and, you know, it was pushed aside to benefit who knows whom. And uh, now it's being legalized, but uh, at the same time, it's being corporatized, which I don't like. Well, I think we just, at some point, I mean, I'd, I'd just like to go into uh, a little bit my own experience. I mean, I, I tried cannabis when I, I was afraid to do it in high school. I just, no, it didn't appeal to me at all. But before I went to college, I had one of my friends, you know, get me some cannabis to try. And uh, I used it occasionally if it you know if it was at a party or something but up here when it that it was it, when it started uh, being easy to get in a, in dispensaries I my wife and I just walked around and we got cards to every dispensary we could just to kind of see what would happen and I spoke to one person who sort of started disabusing me of of the thoughts that I had about cannabis being bad because <laughs> you can't help it if you live in the United States cannabis is evil that's the way you're brought up so anyway, I, I had the experience of taking, uh, taking some pills, taking some, 
decarboxylated THC pills, which means that it's uh, psychoactive. But I took, I took uh, one of those pills, and I, it doesn't really make you high. It just sort of, it just sort of made my body feel sort of solid. So if I'm sitting in a chair, I don't want to get up out of the chair. And I started, I played, uh, I jammed with a couple of friends, uh, played piano with them while I was, uh, had eaten one of those, an hour after I'd eaten one of those. And I could play without being nervous. And I've got a problem with being really, having stage fright. And when I start playing in front of some people, if anything happens, I can just be uh, sent off and my hands shake and I, I can't play anymore. I never thought that. Yeah, yeah. it's just, it's amazing. Yeah. And it's been like that since I was a, uh, I mean, I didn't start playing the piano until I was almost 20. But, but the thing is, is that, that this, uh, this made, this settled my body down and the, medica the medication that I had taken when I was a child was Benadryl, which revved me up. Oh. And, and so, nice. and this was taken, I've read, I've read about this now and that the things that you do to, your, to yourself when you, between the ages or, or they're done to you between the ages of say zero and seven set these patterns for the rest of your life that are very hard to get over. So I think what happened to me is I got, uh, I got revved up. Yeah. And, uh, and then, uh, okay, and uh, this settles me down, but I can tell you that everything I believed uh, about cannabis just and, and the, the uh, government interdicting it, making it pro prohibited, just went by the wayside as soon as I had that experience. So. Will, thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Okay. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. <laughs>
And secondly, if you're going to have a democracy, the people have to have control of the government, which we don't right now. It seems the government has control of us, and they control us on behalf of the corporate elite, who control all of our major political parties, and um, basically control all of our governments. I would say every federal government and every provincial government right now, and for the past 20 years, you know, we always wonder, well, why did they get elected? You know, they lied to us about everything. How was that? Well, it's because it was a lie from the beginning. They don't work for us. Their, their job is to convince us that they do, talking about the politicians now. Their job, but they don't work for us. They work for up top. So there are concrete steps we can take to improve our democracy. One, I think, is proportional representation, which I hope we get, although I know it's very close now. Um, and, and I think that's unfortunate, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, and then we've got to look at what's called parliamentary reforms, which is to reform our parliaments so that the people we elect actually work for us instead of being controlled by the party leadership, which has nothing to do with us. The party leadership can get rid of any of the MLAs or MPs we elect. The party leadership can get rid of them tomorrow and make their lives miserable for years if they don't do what they're told. Well, we're the ones who should be telling them what they're told, and that can be done. Uh, we just have to change the rules. But before we can do any of that, we have to think about it and realize that, no, we're not a democracy. We just passed uh, Remembrance Day a very short time ago. And, you know, to me it was the usual thing, the media and the politicians wrapping themselves in the honor and sacrifice of the millions who have died in these wars, while at the same time the media and the politicians are getting ready to start the new wars and the next wars, which is going to do it to the next generation of young people, all on behalf of those at the very top. Um, we're so far away from what we have to do in order to save our own futures uh, that it's... Uh, but if we focus, I think, on democracy, not so much the symptoms of a failing democracy, like so many homeless on the streets and poisoned food and poverty and a transit, you know, transportation system that's killing us, you know, those are the symptoms. But the problem is we don't have democracy, so what we want doesn't get done. Well, that's, uh, I don't remember what the question was, well, but there's the answer. Well, we're talking about democracy, and you, you brought it into uh, proportional representation. And I, I've been having some discussions, again, on Facebook about proportional representation. And, and I've lived in uh, Europe. I lived in France, and I lived in Germany for a few years. So I know a little bit about how that works. And I found this chart, which I'm not going to, I'm just going to put it up here. Uh, you don't need to see it uh, really closely, but it just lists the countries in Europe that have proportional representation, and it, it, lists, it shows the spread between the share of parliamentary seats and the vote share of the winning party in the last election. And so what you can see is that in Germany, the, the share of parliamentary seats and the vote shares of the winning party are just exactly the same. Whereas in Hungary, which is the, the worst, they have a proportional representation system, but they have a, they have a kind of a right, um, the populist movement uh, going on that throws that out of whack. The main point I want to make about this is uh, in the discussions that I've seen or I've participated in, uh, they've eventually become politicized. And they, the, the argument <laughs> doesn't have anything to do with proportional representation, but it goes to a specific case in Italy or Greece, or it goes to, well, we've always done it this way, what's wrong with it? Uh, England has, or the UK has a proportional, or a first past the post system, and so does France. And those countries, by the way, have a larger spread <laughs> between, the represent, the, between the vote and the representation. So um, I, I just think that, you know, we're, we're at this point where uh, We've got to, as you say, I can't disagree with what you're saying. I just, I just wonder if we have the political will, the people have the political will to make it happen. And the other thing that I just wonder, uh, as, a, as a new Canadian and as someone who's lived in several different countries during my lifetime, including the United States, I just wonder if 
it isn't if it's really going to make that big a difference. So I want to. I'm I'm a, a doubting Thomas. I want to see. I want to see what happens. I'm not, I'm not just going to believe in it. Um, I'm, I voted for proportional representation, and I do believe that it's the the better system. But as far as I mean, I'm from the United States, and I got disenchanted with voting with the voting system back in the early '90s when Bill Clinton was elected, and he had his little dalliance in the Oval Office. And then, uh, in order to divert attention from that, he bombed an aspirin factory in Somalia. And then I went out and watched a movie called Wag the Dog uh, within a week or two of that. And I, and I just thought, I was shocked and I felt betrayed. I felt like this isn't the system that my parents taught me about. It's not the system that I was raised to believe in in school. I can't, I can't believe in this. So I just stopped voting because I thought it's a waste of time. I can be doing other things that are far more productive. Um, my own work was with factory automation and so I was concerned with feeding people and making, you know, making things the way I saw it at the time. I don't necessarily see it the same way, but I just thought I, I can't be engaged in that and, and subsequently now we've even talked about it on the show. I just feel like I've been lied to my whole life. I feel like I've been gaslighted my whole life and so I'm just trying to recover from that and when I see a, a politician now, especially if they're at the provincial or the federal level, I, I can't pay any attention to them because I know they're lying. They don't, they don't have anything to do with me. They don't have anything to do with my life. And uh, the best thing I can do is survive here among people that I like. So I know that's a really bad attitude to have in a democracy. It's just I need to, be, I need to have it shown to me that, uh, that my time would be well spent working for people, but I mean, I've seen the expression on people's face with the Site C dam, with when Justin Trudeau announced that he didn't care about proportional representation because he didn't think it was in the best interests of Canada, and that was a very interesting reason right there, if you, if you think about it. I just see this whole thing is politicians think they know better than we do what to do, what we want and need, and so they're not, it doesn't matter what we do, <laughs> that's what they're gonna do. So I'm, I voted for it, but I'm not willing to uh, get disappointed by it if it if it doesn't pass. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, uh, this show will begin to air around November 28th, and the last day for receipt of all the ballots is November 30th. Uh, from what I've heard, it's very very close. I wouldn't make a prediction uh, about how it's going to turn out. I hope it turns out for PR, and and we'll see we'll see which way it goes. Well, we can we can uh, move into uh, transit, for example. I, you know, we we've seen transit go a, a number of what we would consider poor decisions being made by transit because forcing us to stay in our cars. Yeah. Now I wouldn't say they're poor decisions, I would say they're corrupt decisions. Oh really? You, wouldn't think they're, you don't think they're poor decisions? No, no, I, I don't think, um, I don't think the, the bureaucracy or the civil service works for us. They do what they're told from above, so um, which doesn't mean they're not nice people, but if they want to keep their jobs, they have to do what they're told, and, and yeah. the telling comes from up top. So the people who run our country obviously don't want, for example, trains and trams being used um, because they want us driving cars and burning gas. I mean, I just say that because if you look at the world, that's exactly what we see. So I'm assuming that's what they at the top want. It's not what we the people want. I have no idea what we want. But what we want doesn't really matter. What matters is what they want. And I see cars, even though, is there any doubt that the automobile is helping to destroy our planet? But it doesn't matter. You know, we're, right. we're told what to do. So if you look here in Victoria, we have a train line that runs from Langford to downtown. Oh, we it have tracks. The, yeah, we have tracks. Um, we have one major, one major transit problem in the city, which is the, the call, so-called Colwood Crawl. Uh, the train line runs exactly the same route, basically. It takes people from the western communities into downtown. There could be a few express buses coming off at different places, going to UVic and, and different locations. So that doesn't exist. We're, we've just spent 90 or $100 million to build the Mackenzie Overpass, which is taking longer to build than it took to fight World War II, I think. 
it's been tremendously disruptive to the people who live around there, tremendously disruptive to traffic for the same, no, for much less than that amount of money, but let's say the same amount of money, we could have trains running probably every 10 minutes or less with stations built and the track fixed up from Langford to downtown. But our rulers don't want that. So even here in Victoria, as far away from the centers of world power as you can get, we yeah. see the city government take out the rail bridge, right, so that tra trains to downtown are impossible. We see our newly elected NDP premier say that, in fact, um, there is no business case for trains in Victoria. And this is how things are run. Well, let's see, let's see what happens with, uh, I mean, I still think that proportional representation has a good chance of making it. Here. I very, 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 but, very, very much hope you're right. But let's, uh, let's see what happens because uh, we can't just give up about things, but what we can do is at least watch and, and talk about it. Yes, uh, and I've given up on nothing. I have the highest hopes for the future. I just, you know, that's my perspective of what the real problem is. It's not that people are making stupid decisions. It's that the decisions are made because they benefit the 1% of the 1%. And if you look at it that way, then all the decisions make perfect sense. Site C, absolutely. LNG, you bet. Nuclear power, uh-huh. Well, we're out of time. Thanks a lot, Jack, for this last segment of Citizens Forum. And please join us again in two weeks.